Yeah, so some of this work, um, I think all of this work here about C actually ended up um, in my dissertation, and hopefully it will be in a few papers as well once I, once I get those together. Um, but I'll just give you a brief rundown and a brief overview, and that way we leave more time for questions and other people's presentations. But stop me if I just blow past something and it doesn't make sense. So, first off, we're studying common beans, Phaseolus vulgaris. And they're a common staple crop in many parts of the world. They're a major crop here in Michigan, actually. I think only North Dakota produces more common beans than Michigan in the United States. But around the world, major um, crop centers are in Central America, South America, and in East Africa, where it's used um, as a staple crop for smallholder farmers. So it's very important both in terms of uh, local economy and local livelihood. And it, it's used on, um, sold on markets as well. It's a very highly nutritious crop. And so, for this reason, like this is why we chose beans as our crop of study, because it has all these very important strategic qualities to it. Um, fortunately, though, it's also a plant um, that you can study like any other, so it's suitable for um, measurements by the photosynth device. And for this particular part of our research, we had studied drought stress in a previous section of our research, but we also want to look at other related abiotic stresses. And so for this, we decided to uh, look at heat stress and how different common bean varieties respond to heat stress. Um, and what we really wanted as well is because in a breeding program you have to sort through so many different lines and accessions when you're making your selections about which varieties to keep and which ones to throw away. Um, we wanted to create a pretty quick, efficient method of screening large amounts of um, germplasm, large amounts of cultivars um, for heat stress tolerance and maybe even general abiotic stress tolerance. Um, so you could like maybe go through a thousand cultivars within a couple months and weed out those that aren't maybe heat tolerant and keep those that are and use them in your breeding programs um, down the line. Um, while drought stress is an important stress in common beans pretty much every plant in certain parts of the world, heat stress is actually also a limiting factor for common beans. Um, and complicating matters is that heat and drought are coincident in the field, uh, but even without that, heat will, of course, uh, lower your yield in certain cases. You have very hot um, summer peaks that you have in the middle of your growing season. And also, if an area is just constitutionally too hot, you can't grow any beans there because it suppresses pollination completely and you'll get no seed set. And so, finding cultivars which are more heat tolerant will not only improve yield stability in certain areas, but will also allow you to expand your production to other areas. Um, that's enough about sort of the background. For this particular experiment, we took uh, 14 common bean genotypes and one tepary bean genotype. A tepary bean is a related species known especially for its heat and drought tolerance. Um, it's Phaseolus acutifolius. And so we took these 15 general bean genotypes and used them as a small panel for measuring heat stress. And we had a bunch of replications of each genotype. And we not only used the photosync to take measurements, but we also wanted to compare how the photosync um, how those photosynthesis measurements compared to more traditional gas exchange measurements that we took with the LICOR, and also with simple visual characteristics that we use, sort of a, a qualitative rating scale uh, of general plant health. Um, and so for the experiment, we had them, grew them up in, in a greenhouse, and then moved them to a growth chamber. Uh, and we started the growth chamber out at 35 degrees Celsius. And then every couple days, we would raise it by another 5 degrees. So from 35 to 40, and then two days later from 40 to 45. And we take a suite of measurements uh, on the end of the second day uh, for these different traits. So first I'll show you a few gas exchange measurements that we took on these 15 different bean genotypes. So here, they're just arranged from least to greatest based on the performance at 45C. And so each of these is a different genotype, and each bar represents the performance at a different temperature. So 35 uh, is represented in blue, 40 in red, and 45 degrees Celsius in green. And you can see here, if we're looking at 40 degrees, uh, 35 degrees Celsius, across all their genotypes, there's some slight variation in their general photosynthetic rates. So this is a measurement we took with the light core, 6400. Um, but you see, it's, it's otherwise fairly stable. You'll, you'll get maybe, at the lowest, 12.5 up to 20. Um, under heat stress, you'll have, uh, under 40, sorry, not heat stress, at 40 degrees Celsius, you'll have maybe a slight lowering photosynthesis that you see almost across the board in every genotype, but it's not that much. But it's really when you hit 45 degrees Celsius at this very sort of time-limited window of two days each, 
you don't start to see stress kick in until 45 degrees Celsius. And that's where you get these very large separations among genotypes. So you have some genotypes, like this one, 545, which are basically not doing anything photosynthetically. And then, on the other hand, you'll have the very heat tolerant related species, tepary bean, which is doing just fine. And then you'll even have a few common bean varieties, Zorro and then uh, this uh, breeding line, 538, which will still have some appreciable amounts, even at these very high temperatures, which they normally wouldn't experience in the field for more than a couple hours every day. Um, related to this is stomatal conductance, another gas exchange parameter that we took. Um, and again, the same sort of general trends that we saw as in photosynthesis. Um, you, see, you do see a larger increase uh, just because of physical factors under heat stress, uh, and more water is um, transpiring through the stomates. But then, it's not really uh, a huge impact on the leaves. But again, at 45 degrees Celsius, you start to see an indication of stress. Some of your not-so-good varieties will have closer stomates because they're not uh, doing any photosynthesis. Tepary has its stomates relatively open, again, an indication of a healthy plant. Um, so those are just things we took with the Lycor. Now we get into the measures we took with the photosync, uh, using the photosync platform using the multi-spec device. So here again is photosystem two efficiency, as I'm sure I uh, was talked about in previous um, presentations. So we see the same dynamic we saw with gas exchange, and so we start to see a pretty good correlation here. Uh, 35 degrees Celsius and 40, 40 degrees Celsius. For all of our genotypes, fairly stable photosystem two efficiency. Not a lot of change within a genotype, maybe a little bit for some, but really fairly stable, uh, and not a lot of difference among genotypes either. But again, when we hit that major stress level of 45 degrees Celsius, after a couple of days of 45C, we again get a separation among our genotypes. We have, again, 545, a breeding line that just doesn't do so well under these, these stressful conditions, has a very low photosynthesis and two efficiency, a clear indication of stress. And then you'll have, again, temporary bean, and um, Sarah, another uh, bean variety known for its uh, abiotic stress tolerance, especially drought tolerance, but also in this case heat. You see there it's temporary is essentially unchanged, no effect on its photosynthesis and two efficiency. Um, and Sarah is still doing pretty well too at these temperatures. And so it's actually at this point, it's pretty easy to start separating out genotypes from each other. We start to see this uh, method of, feasible for use as a screening tool. And of course we're able to take non-photochemical quenching at the same time as well. And fortunately we see sort of that inverse. Tebri has very little non-photochemical quenching, so it's not, has it not having to dissipate as much uh, energy that it's absorbing. It can use most of the energy it absorbs for photosynthesis um, and not have to dissipate excess energy because it's, it's uh, photosynthetic machinery is still very capable. Um, but again, our, our less tolerant lines, 550, 548, you start to see this very large rise at 45 degrees Celsius. Um, that's an indication of high stress. And then we also uh, took visual measurements as well. These are just qualitative. Uh, so we rated them on a scale of 1 to 5, 1 being essentially dead, uh, 2 being very damaged, 3 being moderately damaged, 4 showing only slight damage, and 5 being essentially undamaged. So, Plant with a five, completely healthy. Plant that's rated one, pretty much dead. Uh, and we just went through and um, scored each of the, of the replications at the end of the 45 degree period. And so what we see here is again, a pretty nice um, match of what we saw with both our gas exchange data and with our chlorophyll fluorescence data that we took with the photosync. Um, those plants that tended to have higher photosystem two efficiencies, higher rates of photosynthesis, like tepary, tended to also look a lot better too. Just by looking at them, you could tell that they're healthy. And so they rated much higher, visually. Um, and then some of those breeding lines which didn't look too good, things like Jaguar 548, after that period of intense heat stress, um, a lot of them looked essentially very severely damaged. Um, even a lot of them were even looking completely dead as well. And you can see that reflects in the visual score as well. And they rated much lower. Um, and then we just did a quick um, correlation of all these different parameters that we, that we took. And, you know, visual stress is something you can't fake. Like, you can see visual stress very easily. You can sort of pretty easily, qualitatively, get an idea of, like, how well a genotype is performing. And so if you look at here, 
we're relating photosynthesis, A, to your visual rating, there's only a slight sort of connection there. It's, it's all right, but it's not very strong. Actually, the, using the photosync device, uh, taking those photosystem two efficiency measurements, you can see that that correlates uh, much more tightly with uh, the visual ratings that we took. And so, across the board, we do see some general OK correlations among all these parameters that we took. But especially for photosystem two efficiency, we think that's related very well to how a plant is responding to heat stress and can be used as a very quick and efficient screening tool for looking at large numbers of germplasm in this type of experimental setup. Um, and we performed the same experiment as well. Um, and I'll just go over that real quick. But it's essentially what we saw in the previous experiment we saw in this replication. We used a fewer number of varieties and just measured them over a greater number of time to see where exactly um, that onset of stress is happening um, for, this, uh, for these temperatures. So here, this dotted line just represents increasing temperature. We started at 25 in the growth chamber, 25 Celsius. And then every two days, we ramped it up by 5 degrees. So 25 to 30, to 35, to 40, to 45 at the very end. And you see, this is um, photosynthetic rates for these five select genotypes. Really, they're, there's some fluctuation, but they're very stable until about 40 degrees Celsius. Then they take a very large dip at 45. And so in terms of if you had to take one measurement over this entire period, that would give you an idea of how your genotypes are separating out, or in terms of wanting to screen a large number of genotypes with just one measurement at one point, you would want to be taking your measurements at 45 degrees Celsius um, at the end of that second day. Because that's when you start to see your separation from your tolerant genotypes from your less tolerant ones. Um, and this holds true for all the other measures we took as well previously. So malconductance for photosystem to efficiency, where we get uh, actually a much better separation than we did for photosynthesis, certainly. Uh, so here, you know, you have Tepri up top, and then you have all your other genotypes kind of clustered beneath. But for, for um, photosystem to efficiency, you actually get a pretty nice stair step effect from one to the other. And so here you get a, a much more gradated separation among the genotypes you tested. Um, same for NDQ. We also took some, um, some fairly simple biochemical measures of stress. T-bars is, is uh, essentially a measure of oxidative stress to um, cellular membranes. And here again, we don't see any sort of oxidative stress caused by heat until your most severe heat portion at, at 45 degrees Celsius. And then if you look at electrolyte leakage, that's a measure of membrane integrity. So as the plant cell gets more stressed, its membranes become more um, permeable to solutions flowing out of them. And so you see an increase in electrolyte leakage from your plant cells uh, as they become more stressed. So here again, pretty stable across all your temperatures, not a lot of change, not a lot of indication of stress until 45 degrees Celsius. So this all tells us, from this we, we hypothesize and we kind of conclude that the measurements we're taking with the photosync are indeed reflecting uh, actual states of stress in the plant. There's not, some, there's not some hidden stress quality that we're missing when we're using these measurements as a proxy for how stressed the plant is, that they actually do reflect um, the actual stress state of a plant um, as we take those measurements. So there's not, there's not a, a pre-period of stress that we're missing with these measurements. It's as it's happening, we see it. Uh, using the folks to us. So, yeah. And these are just a quick acknowledgement of all the people who helped make this work possible. And, yeah, that's it. I can turn it over to Isaac now. Oh, so, yeah. Thank you. Well, first of all, I guess there's plenty of time for questions. So, yes. Go ahead. Um, for the, uh, I can't remember its exact name, the TEF. Yeah, temporary. Um, I'd love a, a, between the T-bar and then its electrolyte leakage, it seemed like it was kind of in the middle of the pack for stress, but overall it seemed like it had the lowest electrolyte leakage, so is that maybe because the membranes are tougher, or they just have, or is it possible they just have a better way of dealing with that stress? Yeah, and that was interesting too. You see, Tepri's kind of been tried to keep the, the colors constant, but I think they switched on me for these graphs. Tepri here is representing the the light blue. Then you have this other genotype, 541, which isn't necessarily particularly tolerant, but it's not bad. So 
you know, it actually does all, for this experiment, it did, did pretty well compared to the other genotypes we tested. Um, and we think that's because it might have different mechanisms. So that is one thing that, that um, might confound your experiments, is that some genotypes that you measure might be tolerant because they have a certain mechanism. In this case, 5,4 ring might just keep its membranes more intact and free of damage. But it might not have to do with excess energy in other ways. Tepary maybe has membranes that are more easily damaged, but it compensates with that by having better water management and better um, evaporative cooling effects through its stomates, that sort of idea. Um, and so that is one maybe trick thing about screening, especially if you're just using basic visual looking, is that you're not getting an idea of what mechanisms are contributing to its tolerance overall. And that's something you have to punch down more in depth with these sorts of measurements. Um, yeah, Tepary has just a weird sort of membrane response to damage that that we've seen not only with uh, heat stress, but also with job stress as well. And I can't explain it. Yeah, so you did mention you were <coughs> trying to separate heat and drought. Yeah. And I noticed in your visual you had different, especially in one and two, you had different leaves that looked much worse than others. Yeah. Did you see a sense at all of looking at the youngest leaves or the oldest leaves or midway in your evaluation, which leads to the second question, how did you maintain optimal water contents then in the pots as you were heating them up? That was, uh, in terms of your second part, maintaining optimum water, that was not necessarily tricky, but it was strenuous in the sense that uh, I had to water essentially twice a day. Because otherwise, at 45 degrees Celsius, they, they evap evaporate from the pot so quickly, they transpire so much. Um, it is like walking into a sauna when you open up those chambers. And so you had to always be there replenishing that water, especially during that, that high stress period. Um, as for age differences, I did notice that uh, when you start to see the onset of stress visually, it usually tended to start with the older leaves. You can see here some of the cotyledonous leaves, or maybe not, the, I mean the seed leaves, uh, the unifolia leaves are the first to go. And then you'll see some of the older leaves which aren't photosynthetically active. They tend to sort of get the brunt of it. But then you'll also see some of the younger leaves up top, they'll be bleached because they're closer both to a light source, which even in a growth chamber with lower light conditions, is still a some amount of, of radiant oxidative damage that experiences from that light. Um, and so you'll tend to have your most mature leaves that are still photosynthetically active in the middle. Those will be your last leaves to go. Um, and that was true across every genotype that I saw, just sort of um, as, a, as a qualitative sort of uh, measurement, qualitative sort of observation. So on those five pictures, which leaves did you measure? Um, these were taken because it's just a qualitative measurement. I took the plant as a whole. So I sort of counted, I looked at Basically on a percentage basis, if 100% of the leaves on the plant were damaged, it was rated a 1. Yes. If 80% were damaged, I rated a 2. Right. That's the thing. But the photo system, too. Oh, when I took the measurements? I took those measurements. That I did control for. Uh, it was the uh, third trifoliate from the top. So there, were, there was a, tended to be a, mat a maturing trifoliate, <laughs> and then uh, a mature trifoliate, and then that second mature, mature trifoliate below that. That's where I took gas exchange measurements on, and chlorophyll fluorescence measurements The reason on. I ask the question, that's a function of water stress, of course. Right, yeah. If I had taken it you know, lower, those measurements are completely different uh, compared to, I wanted to leave those photosynthetically active, but not still maturing. Yeah, sorry. Um, so during this whole experiment, um, I mean, I would assume that uh, heat stress and light stress usually go hand in hand. Right? Yeah. Um, so, was that under constant light conditions? Yeah, the chambers we were using, um, they had a little bit of light control we might have been able to institute, but it was, it's not very fine. And so it was basically, during the night period, zero micromoles of light. During the light period, um, I think we had it at 400 micromoles, which isn't a huge light load, especially compared to the outside, where you'll get at noon, what, like 2,000 micromoles of, of photons per square meter per second. Um, so, light stress wasn't as intense as it could have been. And so, when you're, when you, that relates a little to your question. So, when you're, when you take those measurements, where was it like more or less the same height then, uh, throughout all these different um, traits? Or yeah. So, it, because again, you look at you look at phi two, which is strongly correlated also with light, right? So, mm -hmm. um, and it seems that it's nicely. Well, nicely correlates with the observations we made for the light bulb. 
So I wonder if that is due to the fact that you have like constant like, images in your chamber. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas others who are outside in the field, you know, you right. experience all these um, fluctuations. Um, yeah, I'm just I'm just trying to like get a little bit. Absolutely. Sure. Yeah, no light fluctuations. So in some respects, these plants had actually an easier environment. It's possible that if we were somehow able to replicate this outside by putting like space heaters in a field, um, you get completely different results because there isn't that light stress component or even that drought stress component that you get on a hot day. Because even if you have a well-watered plant, on a very hot day, um, your, sub your subsoil will dry out actually very quickly. And that can lead to like a transient drought stress right then and there. And so that's something I, I guess, controlled for and protected my plants from in these experiments. But it would be, I, I agree, it would be interesting to see an experiment which um, pumped up all of those, both drought, heat, and light simultaneously. So, any more questions? Otherwise, I have a few. Okay, can I see the tail? Uh, oh, the correlation? The so, what do we get there? The, the, the tail? Uh, oh! Temper. Yeah, the temperature, canopy, 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 canopy temperature. Is that that's what's a, going on there? I didn't include that there. I must have accidentally deleted that slide. So in addition to all um, the measurements I showed you, I also had an infrared camera that I used to measure leaf canopy temperature. And again, this is I sort of integrated over the entire visible um, canopy looking from uh, a perpendicular angle to the canopy. Um, and so that's just... Um, that sort of a measure to see if more stressed plants had higher leaf canopy temperatures, as, as might be expected, and if things like Tepe were able to maintain lower leaf temperatures. Uh, that particular measurement I didn't think was terribly well correlated with my other stuff, but actually, now, look, now that I'm looking at it, um, leaf canopy temperature correlates quite well with not only photosynthesis, um, but also somatic conductance, which is to be expected. Expect if your plants have a higher somatic conductance, they get some of that latent cooling effect by um, when water vapor is removed from the leaf tissues into the surrounding atmosphere, that evaporative uh, cooling effect. Yeah, it's interesting that uh, leaf temperature correlates better with um, photosynthesis than it does with photosystem two efficiency, and that that I'm not sure why there's this sort of slight decoupling. Maybe it's because I had I only had eight replications per genotype and 15 genotypes, so maybe with more Replications, we'd see a tighter correlation among those traits. Um, but at least they're both in the right direction. <laughs> How easy was it to do that measurement and growth Um, I'm not the tallest person in the world, but if I'd been any taller, it might have been a lot more awkward. I kept hitting my head on against the lights of the growth chamber. And I had to um, sort of Godzilla my way across plants to, to measure them. But it's possible, um, especially because it's trying to get a single plant resolution. Mm -hmm. You have to get, you have to make sure you're the, you're the exact same distance from each uh, leaf canopy, and you have to make sure you're like perfectly positioned over it. It would have been easier in the field. The new monthly spec has a leaf temperature. Yeah. So the the new monthly spec will so when you clamp the leaf, um, it has a little um, leaf temp or temperature sensor uh, on there so that you can. Get the leaf temperature. So. And you said that's a touchless one, right? It's just. Um, um, I mean, it probably will touch the leaf, but it's. Okay. Um, it, don't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the but um, but yeah. So um, I, of course we have to we have to test it and see what we measure mm -hmm. if it's really true and what the error range is. But um, yeah, it has a leaf temperature sensor in there as well. So that's you cool. would you would get that data with it. Yeah. And that was one of the things, I actually ended up using the infrared camera because of something I think Dr. Sharkey told me was that in a lot of cases if you like stick a thermometer onto a leaf, you're measuring the temperature of the thermometer, not your leaf. Because <laughs> the leaf is such a thin, thin amount of mass. And so I think that, I think they said it was a touchless uh, thermometer yeah. they're using. And so I think that's why I ended up using the infrared camera because there's no um, interference from the tool you're using. Um. So. Any more questions? Otherwise, I, I have like one, wait, one more flood. So, um, would you consider this data as something that is worth taking in your um, trade selection process? Or is that, I mean, what was your experience with that? I mean, is it 
is it more helpful? Would you like fully rely on just on that data, or do you think it's it's always um, helpful to have the additional data like on the gas exchange measurements? Um, it probably comes back to how many plants I had to measure. If I had to measure much more than the ones I was using, it mm -hmm. might have been infeasible to even try and use gas exchange. Simply because you couldn't measure more than 60 plants in a period of time in which the photosynthesis won't naturally change with the um, period of the day. So if you try and measure photosynthesis over the course of two hours, you'll get fairly stable measurements, even just measuring the same plant one after the other. But if you're measuring the same plant one measurement after the other over the course of three or four hours, you'll see, uh, you'll see that photosynthesis start to go down as the day length increases. As, you're, you know, as the day goes on, photosynthesis starts to get some amount, of, at least in a field setting. Um, so that's why I use the most space soon because you take more measurements for screening. So, yeah. so if you were to do it in a field, since like two hours is like your window, you do one section two hours one day and then another day at the same time do another section of the field because that's what I'm running into right now because I'm only one person and I can't right. take that many measurements. And that's sort of what you have to do. At that point, I think you would call on the local peanut tech area. That's what I mean. That feeling would be calling on. doing the whole measurement in two hours. Yeah. The feeling would be good. Yeah. In that case, that will give you a good idea. The donuts and so on. Make sure they're not just hot out of the oven. Yeah. <laughs> no, I would provide lemonade. <laughs> <laughs> <Thanks. laughs> <laughs> okay, so if there are no further questions, then uh, I think we can move on. Next speaker, thanks again. Yeah. So our next speaker is um, Isaac Onsinga. Yes, um, from originally from Uganda, where he yeah. got his um, bachelor, and he's now working on his PhD thesis here. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just going to continue uh, from where this has been. I'm trying to expand on uh, his basic research to more of applied, trying to screen uh, that platform for screening, early, early, early uh, sibling screening in dry beans. Uh, when, when you look at drought stress, and I think the condition is, is completely different from under greenhouse condition. Uh, basically, the first, this, this, this picture was taken in Uganda, and uh, that's how farmers usually grow their beans with maize in the crop. And that's typically at the early stage when it is hit hard by drought, probably may, may not get anything uh, from that field. And this, this was taken in Michigan. Here, this is a uh, different plant responding to drought stress. And as you do lift the fluorescence, and then here it lead maturity, and at the end, you know, that brings a lot of uh, difference in terms of maturity of plants, or other, other plants have been defoliated. And this can be the end result when the plant is heavily uh, under stress. This is never been a small bean, and can greatly affect the quality of, of seed. Probably nobody, nobody will buy that seed. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so, uh, drought stress is a complex trait, uh, and because it's controlled by major many, many genes that have minor effects, and we know that both root stress and root stress are very important when it comes to response to drought. But basically, here I'm focusing on root stress, and we are trying to use now for instance, as a platform for doing that. And one of the bigger challenges has been to quantify. The responses and how how do we do it for bringing back a system. And that's why I'm trying to uh, use the photo scene for identifying those tricks associated with the last tricks. And here I'm using this HP panel, this is an end of panel. I just put here as an MSU. MSU is a community of you know so many people from different countries here and the And the same thing here for the panel I'm using different seed types, colors, and all that. So this is the population I'm using. Uh, it's a jump that is collected from different breeding programs throughout the world, from the US, Africa, uh, uh, Latin. Latin America, and all that. So they have different market classes, different seed colors, and all that. But all from the Andean uh, gene pool. 
and this is what I've been doing. So the, the, my objective here is really to use uh, early signaling stage as we are trying to screen for drought. Uh, when, whenever we go, sometimes when you try to screen under field conditions, it's highly variable, and sometimes it's not. Time when you're expecting drought, you expect you to get rain. I had that experience last year in Uganda. <laughs> I went to plant during off season, and there was a lot of rain. <laughs> so, yeah. So now we're trying to see if we can uh, do a high throughput screening at a sitting stage. Basically, here the, 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 I'm targeting a uh, 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 stage of growth which is B3 before flowering. At least when the leaves have got a a tri is almost, you know, a, a bean plant normally starts flowering from 35 to 35 and above days after planting. But here I'm targeting, uh, probably here I'm, I'm targeting that 21 days because I want at least the, the lower tri is to be mature enough to allow me to measure what photosynthesis more uh, appropriately. So here I'm using uh, those small pots and this, uh, there are 230 genotypes that have been screening and uh, in those small pots in the greenhouse, and I, I watered them for 21 days, and then I, after 21 days, I stopped watering. And the question would come, how do I control for watering? What I usually do is, I just uh, fill the pots up to fill capacity when they are really draining to make sure that all the, all the pots are full. I, I just go multiple times so that they, 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 they are, they, they, I see enough water is draining from each of the pots, I'm very sure that all the uh, pots at their field capacity. That's the only way I can control for for, for water. Otherwise, if you, if you're going to take measures to measure using maybe a, a, an instrument, so that's going to take so much of your time. So the only way I was able to just uh, able to, to just what to, to water it. And then uh, when I'm using uh, photos photos I I usually take the two. Uh, uh, basal trifolies when I'm taking melanin, so I use the two trifolies. Since uh, the lower leaves always uh, have, always experience more stress when they are, when 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 the plants begin losing, and when the, when the plants are under stress, the, the lower leaves tend to be uh, more responsive to to drought stress at that stage. So I use the first two trifolies in every melanin, and the I usually go there. Most times, I usually start well, taking my melanin from around nine, and the highest I can go is up to around one or two. It can be sometimes for this many types for two days per, per plant. It can be so hectic here, yeah. but that's what I've been doing. So after doing that, and I do it every after two days, because my objective here was to look at the trend. What happened to photosynthesis uh, as the Plan is stressed, so I look at the trend. So again, every two days I'm taking uh, uh, methamine using the photosynthesis, and then I also do the visual rating to look at you know uh, the uniform senescence and the leaf weighting and all that concurrently for these 14 days, and that's what they are presenting here. Just a summary of, of what what happens as a trend, and this is what happens. Uh, that is. Uh, File two, basically the, the blue line there is for for controls, and then the, 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 the red line is for, for drought stress. So you see that for 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 control it is it is just constant. Then there's no decrease or increase in the file two. But as you as as you see from the as the great uh, as you drought stress continues, file two begins lowering down from my experiment for, from day eight, and then to day 10, you find like it's really way down, or this is on average. But you find like those plants which are actually good, you know, still maintain it, but those ones which are, which are growing like this, they have very low uh, pie to. This is like after 10 days, how the plants will look like in the greenhouse. So some of them will have what really lost, uh, is so much wilted, others will still be green. So overall, the fight, the fight to really drops significantly the way with increase in drought. And then this is the, the photo inhibition. I also try to check for that data and try to see what happens 
uh, and, and NPQ. So generally, uh, here with the with this uh, QL for control is relatively constant, and also NPQ, which is this color here, is relatively constant under under all conditions for the for the for the ten days. But when it comes under drought, uh, the for the heat tends to drop a little bit, not so high, but a little bit. But here the plants tend to display so much heat, which is here. This is just like this has been normalized. But no, if you are measured, it can be, the thing can go up to around 10 or 15 and so on. But I've just removed uh, all those outer layers of uh, normalized to one. That's why you see it very high here. Yeah. After 10 days. So now you can see very much increase from 6 days to 8 days. The plants really display so much of that uh, heat energy. That's what out can use for processes. So at 10 days, when they're like this, there's a lot of heat energy that's been displayed out. And then when you look at the spar measurements, uh, for the controls, it's stable. There's nothing much that happens. But when you look at the drought, uh, spar tends to drop, but not so high. Uh, not so high within these days. And also, uh, the electron four, I try to measure that. I, I try to do that too. It tends to increase also a little bit. Not, not so high. And then uh, when I compare this one with the with the viso ratings, so the eight day is here when I began seeing so I in what in the in the overall performance is actually here. That there is still no difference in the visual rating. But now when it comes to ten days, you get now uh, some of the suits begin to wear. But when it is twelve days very high. On 14 days, some of the plants have completely died. So, the, for you to, you can actually see that the photosynthesis system begins to break down eight days. That is when you are using the photosynthesis, but visually, you cannot see it. But you see that on, after eight days, the, the photosynthesis, I mean, the photosynthesis part is really begin to respond to the stress. But it's only up to that's when you can see the difference visually. And, and I think to me, uh, these are some of the plants that, that survived just like after this one, after, uh, after 14 days. So the, this one is completely died, but this one is out of state. They are still doing well under drought stress. So, what uh, after doing uh, all that, uh, just my conclusion that uh, drought effects, effect of drought stress on photosynthesis, such as, uh, 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 I mean, drought affects photosynthetic uh, uh, tricks, phi 2 and NPQ, but linear electron flow and photonic inhibition. And these ones are detected at an early stage of, of when the stress will still be at the onset of the, of the stress and which can be actually complement the visual rate. So both the photosync measurement and the visual, visual rate, if you combine them together, I think can be used for, 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 for assessing and identifying traits for drought stress tolerance. And the, as, a, as a major concern, what has been the, the issue of the light, high light intensity, I don't know how to be under field conditions. When, you, when the plants are already drying and have high light intensity, so how that can affect the uh, measurements in under field conditions. That's a, that's a big part of my concerns. So the future prospect of what I'm doing is I intend to uh, use some of this uh, trait to understand the genetic architecture after look after getting help from 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 the team trying to fit some of the data so that we can get all the noise out and uh, I'll try to want to see. The, the genetic uh, picture of some of the traits, especially at the early stage, since I've already really got both visual data and also the processing data as a train, I think can give me some insight to what's happening at the, at the general level. And I also intend to use this for field type in, in Uganda and see how uh, that work out. Otherwise, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Kelly. Why was uh, Prima 
and all the people in my lab. Thank you. Okay, type of questions. Yes. Isaac, excellent summary. I have a question that photosync system is just an eight second measurement. How long is it from the time you clamp it till you get the data? Or you're satisfied you have the best data? Uh, normally, the whole, all those measurements, uh, everything that takes around 15 seconds. Two. Okay. Two seconds? 15 seconds. 15. Yes. To get all the measurements for all the trips you want. Every measurement that takes you normally 15 seconds. Good. And then I, I, I usually take two measurements per plant. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it depends how many protocols you yeah. have. Like yeah. if you're using all the protocols, it's more like 40 seconds. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Sure. Isaac, you didn't say anything about differences between genotypes. Yeah, that, that's now my, 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 my next phase. So after looking at the train, so I'm going to use either. 10 days data or the 14 days data where they're really different mm -hmm. to look at the difference in the genotypes, which actually which genotype was having a good performance under 14 days and which traits actually specifically uh, make it different from the rest. Yeah. Can you give us any hint? Do you see genotypic differences? Yeah, I do. Uh -huh. I do. Most of them, especially, that's like I have the control tetrapin. Yeah. Tetrapin tends to be very conservative, tends to have very high. Uh, High phi, phi um, then have high spot values, high phi to uh, NP, 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 uh, NP, NP, yeah, NPQ values. But even if you if it's from 10 to 12 to 14 days, it tends to be very conservative, very minimal. Mm -hmm. But there is, uh, for those on which are actually very uh, sensitive to drought, they, they can have very high values at the beginning, but as they uh, as Drought continues to uh, progress. We find the, all the photosynthetic apartheid collapses and they can no longer maintain any anything. Any so just, just dry it. Yeah. But I mean, the, the application of this too would be to handle larger numbers, like your uh, Jesse had a many, I don't know, 15 gene types. You yes. what, 200 and some? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you're, you're seeing differences. <laughs> Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, I, I'm, I'm really seeing differences in different interaction between genotypes for, for the traits. Yeah. I use it. Yeah. Uh, in the greenhouse, it's easy to go from full water to complete stress. If you go to the field, how do you think your numbers would change if you had had a, an extended period but slower drought? Like if it took you 30 days instead of 15 days to get a dead plant. Now, okay, the, 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 that, that, the, that's the reason why I was minimizing the size of, of the of the root system, I mean of the root system, because uh, the, what what you what you're saying applies under field conditions. You know, the plant have a, a very extensive root system and they tend to scavenge water when it is dry. But here I was narrowing down, I was narrowing down what the root the root growth to make sure it is a, a bit minimal, but I can measure. I can measure the, the above ground rates. But of course, there will be differences, of course, under field conditions. So, um, 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 what I'm planning is to have irrigated, uh, irrigated what? Irrigated treatment and non irrigated treatment. So, I'll be able to see those differences if the if there's prolonged drought. Basically, of course, I'll be considering taking data and that will be able to see the differences uh, over time. Maybe probably, maybe it may take more days than I'm on the same degree house. But I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that those plants which are sensitive, if they are, if the mechanism for for their drought uh, drought tolerance is based on soot rates, I'll be able to actually apply the same trend in the in the greenhouse in the field. But if it's under based, based on the root system, that will be a different thing. I was just reading a <coughs> paper that's way outside of my area. What is it? The quantitative trait you have a QTR? Is that what it's called? QTL. 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 They, they noticed that in the greenhouse there were five QTL changes to the drought stress when went to the field. It was 240. <laughs> okay. So yes. how do you feel you're going to see what what you see at least in the greenhouse? Yeah, that, that's why, okay, in, in my... There are several approaches that I'll be using here. One is the, the genome-wide assessment mapping, where I'm using this panel here, yeah. the 200. I also have another uh, uh, 
uh, by parental population, which is made of two parents, contrasting for that trait. So I'm going to use both the by and the whole uh, uh, germplasm, and put them under the same condition so that I'll be able to narrow down uh, some of those uh, numbers here. Yeah. So, so this is a question for both Jesse and you. Um, you know, you both compared visual ratings to the photosync data. At this point, do you trust your eyes or do you trust the device more? <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice question. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, basically, based on the, just the same thing you have been saying, you know, uh, there's something that I can visualize see accurately more than the uh, instrument. This, what, uh, what I think this means, because sometimes it's not the way you hang, the way you take a measurement, or the way you know you take a bit and so do something like that. Mm -hmm. So if if there is a very strong correlation between my visual measurement and the one of the photos, I'll be happy. That's what I mean. <laughs> yeah. For me, I think even in my perfectly controlled environment, like everything was, every factor was controlled except for. Heat, which I varied, which I controlled that. I suppose I controlled every every environmental factor actually. Um, even then, the correlations weren't perfect between any of the things I measured. So I think, and then they're all measuring slightly different things. Um, and this is just for heat stress, even. So, like, I think of all the other traits that you have to, to measure for if you're choosing uh, which plants to keep for your breeding breeding population, which ones to discard. Um, how much of that can be measured with a measurement taken in perfect health, or how much of that can be measured with a single device, even one as great as the photo sync. Um, <laughs> I would, at least for this one, I find that I, personally, I can get biased towards which plants I like more. So even taking a qualitative like visual measurement that I was, um, I'm not sure how successful I was, but I had to be very careful about not being like, oh, this is temperate, so of course it's going to be a five. Yeah. Like, that's very hard not to do, personally, because like you kind of get invested, like, this is my winning plant and these are the loser plants, and I don't want to see them do well, so, like, I bet mentally that does cause me to, like, yeah. maybe rate, you know, 541 just a little bit lower than I might otherwise. Can, can, can I answer that question? Yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> but my answer would be, do you want to get it published or not? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we were going to say, take some other questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think the big problem with measuring, like taking a drought experiment into the field is creating the drought and how you do that and how you make sure that it's actually stressful enough to observe responses in the year or years in which you have to complete the experiment. You know, like it might not be, it might be a really wet year and then whatever treatment you're applying might not be very... Strong, but I think your data are great in that they suggest that the photosync response happens sooner than the visual response. So, you know, it might be more sensitive to smaller fluctuations in drought stress mm. than, you know, a larger plant trait like leaf vapor. But it still is really hard to, yeah. to yeah. exclude enough water. I mean, beans may maybe be easier than switchgrass because they too deep roots, but <laughs> <laughs> trying to create a drought treatment can be Yeah, challenge. what I'm also trying to do is, you know, uh, do as many replications as possible. Right now, actually, I'm running my fifth replication for this, and I'm trying to make sure that I get a lot of data as possible, just to make some of those uh, biases. Yeah. Yeah. Well, other more questions, or? Thank you guys, thank you again. Thank you for joining the session. <laughs>